Hello, listeners and viewers. If you are tuning in, welcome. We are re-upping interviews, and I'm really pleased to be joined by Missouri State Senator Holly thompson Raider. She is the author of this really fantastic but eye-opening memoir. I don't know if you can see it because of my blurred back, but it's called Cinder Girl, Growing Up on America's Fringe, a memoir. And we're going to talk about her memoir, her upbringing, how it influences her public policy decisions in the state legislature, and also some current events. Senator Holly Rader, good to talk to you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for having me so much. And let's stick with Holly. It's much easier. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I got to be formal because, you know, you have a title and I was raised to give formal titles, but Holly sounds great. So Holly, talk about what led you to write the book. Why now? Why about your life story? You know, I, um, it took me about six years to write it and And it's, it's kind of been percolating in me for some time. And just, um, you know, many years ago, back in the corporate setting, when, you know, I would be having lunch with others and and we'd talk about something from our childhood and people would say, wow, I mean, you needed to write a book about that. You know, like, where was your first kiss? And, you know, everyone's was something like, you know, at the football game or this, that, and, you know, mine was on the back of a Greyhound bus when I was 11 with some teenage boy I met on that particular trip, you know, and so everybody's like, whoa, wait a minute, you know, you need to write a book. And so I've had that really percolating in me for a while, but being in public policy as a state legislator in the House and then now in the Senate, it was really even more obvious to me that people that haven't been raised around uh, mental illness, hasn't been raised around addiction, really don't get it. And so most, most folks are raised in a vacuum. And so we don't know what we don't know. I had the privilege, actually. I mean, I'd, I moved over 30 times from the end of the third grade to the beginning of my 10th grade when I had to quit school to help take care of my family many negatives of that, of course, but the positive of that was, is I saw so many different cultures. And so I can have empathy for other cultures where so often and many times in public policy, we just don't have that. And so to me, writing my story, because I've told it so many, so much of it on the floor of the House and Senate, to me, writing it and really giving a good visual is to help people understand what it's really like on that other side. Many of us start from a very different lane, from a different starting block. And you have to take that into consideration. And as I was reading through the book, and I think without giving so much giveaways of the book, because I want people to read the book as well, I recall that you had noted that you were surrounded by obviously mental illness and addiction. It hit your mother, it affected your aunt, and also your daughter too. So how was it grappling with all of that? And how did you stay strong throughout that whole process? I know you laid out through the book, but give everyone kind of a cliff notes version of what really compelled you to kind of stay the course with all those challenges. You know, God has been number one in my life since I was four. And um, I've just really clung to God and, and trusted him above all others. And it, it's just, it's something that it's hard to explain for the way that that I started believing so early and the way that I relied on him so, so early, but I wanted different. I wanted different for me. I wanted different for my family. Um, I didn't want them to have that same life that I had. And I clung to God and tried to be pleasing to him to be able to, to get us out of that. And you were able to help your daughter get out of the the spell of addiction. She, she seems to be doing well, according to your writings. And I bet you get this question a lot. How can you be a conservative Republican and care about these issues? Is it obviously kind of partisan bending? Are you seeing more Republicans care about this issue and tackling it head on, uh, whether or not they have direct experience with it? Cause I know we hear, we hear about the opioid crisis. We hear about mental illness. But I think you're one of the few, I would say, Republican lawmakers I've heard of who's really focused in on it. And I haven't really heard much of Democrats focusing on it as in detail as you have uh, with our brief interaction that we've had over the course of a few months. Uh, But do you think Republicans can tackle this issue? Are you hoping to kind of change that perception? I am. And, you know, and, and so I've been in the legislature for 10 years now, eight in the House and two in the Senate. 
and just the education that I've been able to give on on addiction as a disease, as you know, all, all of these different things that have, have been medically and scientifically proven for years. But um, again, people don't know what they don't know. And so just through the education process of it, I have seen so many of my colleagues um, really turn around and begin to help and start pushing in on things that I never thought I would. And so I really do feel, and, and there's also been such a stigma where, you know, right now we know one in three families have been affected by the opioid crisis in some way. Well, that's a lot of people. And so you, you have someone close to you or you know someone with someone close to them that is affected by this. And I think that we're getting to a point where people no longer think it's, you know, oh, the best thing for me to do is just to stick my head in the sand and move on. That actually, okay, I have the power to affect change. How can I help? And, and truly, when I link that to the way of breaking the poverty cycle, because if you're, and I've had to say this on the floor so many times, but even, even if you don't care about the human capital, right? Even if that's not on your radar, if you're a fiscal conservative, then you absolutely still want to find solutions for the opioid epidemic. You absolutely still should want to find solutions to the poverty cycle because those are all, that's the biggest piece of the pie of our state budget. So the residual effects of, of, of a mama getting addicted and her baby's getting put into foster care and her losing her job and no longer becoming a taxpayer, um, all of those residual effects, those children, then you look at, at the outcomes of our babies going into foster care and how their lives turn out, all of, all of that affects the state budget. So even if you're just a fiscal conservative, you should care about this issue. Besides the focus on addiction and mental illness that you've been obviously focusing on, what else has been kind of your top policy positions that you've been advocating for, not only in the state Senate, but previously when you were in the House? In the state Senate, I've really focused on domestic violence and sexual assault. And we were able to get a really good package passed this year that um, focuses on sex trafficking of children, um, changes some of our domestic violence laws. And so I'm very proud of that. In the House, when I first came in, I worked on things, you know, that you think of as a conservative working on. I, I carried right to work. Uh, prevailing wage modifications was was my bill, you know. So I I did some. I I have those conservative credentials, you know. I've I've shown where I'm at on on the conservative um, uh, matrix, I guess. But um, and I think that that's also given me credibility for people from both sides of the aisle to listen and, and try to be helpful on some of these issues that sh absolutely should not be partisan. You were talking about having an emphasis on conservation too. And do you have any thoughts on, let's say the energy policy? I know Missouri has an interesting um, energy policy. I don't know if you could speak to it that much, but if you wanna weigh in on both of those issues, I would love you to chime in. So on conservation this year, I was a uh, chosen conservation Senator of, of the year, which was a high honor, uh, very surprising to me. But you know, we have a lot of issues with feral hogs in my area. We're um, very rural. And so we've, we, we have, we want to absolutely balance our dog hunters, right? That, that want to hunt hogs and want to use their dogs for, for hunting in general versus, um, the difficulties of those feral hogs and the expanding population and how they tear up our farmers' fields. And um, heck, I had one farmer that had planted three times and then finally give it, just gave up. And I mean, it's just really bad. And so our conservation department has really worked hard on balancing that between our, um, our dog hunters with our farmers and with getting, getting that feral hog population um, 
eradicating the federal feral hog population. And, you know, they've done it by working with landowners, working with farmers, and um, we're really getting somewhere now. And so that's been one of the challenges that I've worked on for the last few years. We've also, Missouri, uh, black bear is, is, you know, native to us and so exciting that we now do a black bear hunt. And so um, those are all super cool and near and dear to my heart. I want us to be able to do more of the black bear hunting. And then of course, um, fishing is my favorite pastime. That's kind of my solace. That's my, I, I live out in the country. I have a, a right on the Mississippi river. And so I have a pond right next to my home and it's just incredibly peaceful to be out in God's creation and to have such natural resources available to us. And, you know, we think about things with the food supply and the shortages that we're seeing and the, the ships and the ports being so backed up, um, the containers. And I live right next to a port, you know, one of, one of the largest ports in Southeast Missouri. And, you know, you, you have to know that there are some future concerns and so it's um i'm very thankful to have such a great conservation department in missouri and then also just the plethora that missouri offers when it comes to our, our natural habitat and um our ability to have great conservation you guys have some great fishing it's missouri is one state i have not visited yet but everyone tells me the trout fishing is excellent i have talked to your likely future Senator, uh, Eric Schmidt, the attorney general, and he's talked okay. about some of the history and some of the hunting and fishing offerings. So you guys are very proud of your outdoor heritage and you absolutely should be. It's a good model that your state has had in place. And I remember writing about the black bear situation, how PETA was claiming that the black bear is endangered, which is very, very patently false. The bear is healthy. The management system will keep yes. the population in check. And so, yeah, yes. some people have tried to undermine what you guys are doing. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I mean, just this morning, just my drive to the gym and back, I passed a family of deer just right down from my house. They hang out here, which I adore. And um, and then a family of turkey that I had to stop and wait for because they're quite arrogant and they make you wait for them to cross the road. <laughs> but, you know, it's just it, it's an incredible place to live. And and we do. I mean, it's our seasons, our hunting seasons are, are really managed well by our department. We have um, dove season coming up, you know, I mean, we just, we really have great opportunity here when it comes to those who like to hunt and fish. And I wanted to go back to your mentioning of right to work. I don't know if you've been following what is happening to freelancers or kind of what the federal and what certain states are doing to kind of make it harder for small business, one person businesses to be able to freelance, to be able to do the right to work. Um, if you have followed it, what are your thoughts on those infringements and attacks to people who want to be freelancers? Because some of the National Democrats goals, kind of in a nutshell, if you're not familiar, is to basically unionize all workers, especially workers who don't want to be unionized. They, they're not W-2 employees. They want to be 1099 filers. Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? I know in Missouri, there's probably a good chunk of people who want to keep their freelancer livelihoods, but I was wondering what your thought was about that. You know, I haven't followed the issue, but look, this is America and we are based on freedom and personal choice. And that's what it needs to stay. It needs to stay that. And great, if you want to be in a union and you want to pay dues and you want someone else to fight your battles and you want to be in that um, group mentality, that's fine. That's your choice. But for those of us who are individuals, individual, we don't want somebody else fighting our battles. We want to fight for the wages that we, we feel are fair. We want to work in the places that we want to work and, and move from, from where we want to move. From. We, we don't want that. Then we should be able to have that as well. And so it makes me crazy to see the other side of the aisle trying to push that when it's like, we have so many things that are important <laughs> to work on <laughs> for society and for humanity. And it's like, why are we trying to remove the freedoms that those, that people have? I mean, if you want to join a union, join a union. That's up to you. Don't push that on me. That's a, that's a good refrain, I guess. Uh, but um, this issue should be bipartisan. And I'm trying to put it on more Republican lawmakers' radars. And I know since you already helped pass it, 
you don't need any nudging or pushing there, but, but look into that from the small business side too, because with this inflation reduction act, actually, most of the people who will be impacted are the one person businesses. So those making under 200,000 and a good chunk of people, freelancers have started to make over a hundred thousand dollars. There was an increase from 3 million to 3.8 million from 2020 to 2021 alone. So I, I feel like they're going to be targeted the most under the inflation reduction act. Well, I will for sure look into that. And, you know, in Missouri, we did pass it, but it got um, pulled back on the ballot. Ah, interesting. So it's not really codified into law, so to speak. It is not. It is not. And so um, I I will most definitely look into it. (laughs) Yeah. And and what other issues? I know you have a focus on taxation and business policy, but is there anything else that you're focusing on that you want the listeners and viewers to be aware of? You know, I think um, we certainly have with the opioid crisis, um, domestic violence, which, you know, I've been working on. And then we also have um, sex trafficking, which is is actually more prevalent than I think people know. And um, in, in Missouri is is one of the states that have a higher problem of it. And so one of the things that we did this year is we've set up in the bill that that I just passed, uh, Senate Bill 775, we set up a um, a sex trafficking task force to try to look and see what these other states have done, what we need to do, what we're not doing, because we we've got to do better. We've got to do better. And so that's one of the areas. Um, Homelessness is another one of the areas that I've been working on. And I've been working on that with the Cicero Institute out of Texas. We were able to um, pass a bill this year um, on on banning street sleeping and camping on public lands, but but that is banning that, but then having shelters or sanctioned encampments for homeless folks to go to, and then coupling that with mental health services. So. 75% studies show that 75% of our homeless have mental health issues, 75% have drug addiction, the majority have both. So when you, with our national housing first model, that just gets people into, into home. So you're, you're just moving them from no home into a home and that's not the root of their problem. You know, the root of their problem is typically drug addiction or mental illness or both. And so actually offering those services and getting folks in a temporary location while getting them the services that they need so that you can help them stabilize and then get into a healthy, happy lifestyle is is really the model that works. And so we're, we passed this in Missouri. I know that Cicero Institute out of Austin, they're working on some other states right now as well. But getting that, um, we've, we've passed the bill. Now we need to get that in, into process. Now we need to you know, see, see how that looks. Work with all of the, all the stakeholders. And, and you know, we have some really good folks working on homeless, homelessness in Missouri right now. But what we need to do is we need to give incentives So that those who are doing a good job of getting people into services, getting them into jobs so that they get bonuses instead of giving more money to just the more people you help, right? You want to have better outcomes. And as a state, that's what we should be doing. So I've been working on that as well. Excellent. Thank you for the update. I want to get your view on what is happening in Missouri politically or where you see your state going it's become a very red state across the years since I've been politically active. I think at one point it was a swing state, but it's gone very, very much in the red category. What can people take away from what Missouri is doing, why it's trying to maintain, obviously, a lot of its conservative credentials and, and keep going in that direction? But what do you think people have to look forward to with Missouri's future politically, um, whether it's for federal elections, your coming Senate race, or perhaps what is happening in the state legislature? You know, we are one of the lowest states when it comes to taxes, and we are uh, positioned for another tax cut. We're going to go in 
most likely during our veto session in September and have a special session at the same time and expedite a uh, tax cut that is coming, expedite that tax cut. And the reason is, is because we put these together several years ago to where as we hit benchmarks, then we can lower taxes. That has really spurred our economy. It has worked, right? And so our tax policy is working. So we're going to speed that up a tad. And um, so the benefit of that, of course, is that Missourians are gonna get even more of a tax break. Um, we have one of the lowest in business and corporate tax uh, structure. So we really are well positioned. That's been something that we've, we've been working on as party for some time. I look for that to continue. Um, we definitely, we, we are in the heartland, right? We're, we're right where you have tons of highways. We're on the Mississippi, Missouri River. We have many ports, um, excellent rail service. We're an excellent state. We've talked about how, you know, our conservation department is nationally ranked. I mean, they're so good. We have a lot to offer and our, our state taxes is definitely one of the things that's, that's a big draw. And so as a, as a state, as a legislature, I know that we're really working to help bring folks in and maybe have more businesses locate here, elderly locate here. So it, it's a good state. I think that's what you'll see more out of Missouri. Do you have any final parting thoughts, whether it stems from your book or any other thoughts on public policy that you want to share with everyone who's watching or listening? You know, my book is twofold and that is one, it is to help. Um, look, there's, as I said, one in three, you know, that, that have had to had struggled with addiction or know someone close to them that has. And hopefully it's, it's twofold. It will help those that have the, the power to affect change, to maybe see mental illness and addiction a little bit differently and um, use the, the tools that they have at their disposal to be helpful and to have better outcomes. But then also to have kids who grew up like me, um, you know, I'm dyslexic. I talk about that in the book, you know, just that, that your past doesn't have to define you. Where you came from doesn't define you. Even the mistakes that you've made yourself doesn't have to define your future. Um, I want people who grew up like me to realize that there's hope, but you have to put your head down and work for it. I mean, this is America and our opportunities are endless. And so I want people to know that grew up like me, that they can be what they want to be. They just have to work for it. Um, their past doesn't have to define them. And for those who are in positions like mine to have some empathy and, and let's work together and make some changes that, like I said, I mean, it helps the state budget, but it all, it also will help families. And that's the most important part. I will definitely encourage everyone to get Cinder Girl. It is a great read. If you want like a comparison, everyone watching and listening it, to me, it reminded of help hillbilly elegy, but I think it was even more impactful. Holly Rader, we are very, very delighted to speak with you, Senator Holly Rader of Missouri. She has a great book. Obviously, if you want to get the book or read the book or learn more about her work in the Missouri legislature, we will include everything in the show notes. So Holly, thank you so much for speaking with me. Thank we wish the, you tremendous luck in the book sales I and everything. Very much. Thank you for having me on.